today. Today I'm going to be talking about 1 Samuel chapter 3, and I'm going to talk about listening to God. And I'm going to use this wonderful, exquisite meal preparation that I brought with me today. This, by the way, is the kind I have to get for my daughter because she doesn't like any kind except for thick and creamy craft macaroni and cheese. Now, how many people in here have ever made macaroni and cheese? Would you raise your hand, please? All right. How many of you ever had a child who for a time in their life would only eat macaroni and cheese? Yes, I had one of those. Mike, I saw your hand because we've had that conversation before. It's amazing what happens when they get married and all of a sudden they'll eat their wives' food. It's just funny how that happens. Macaroni and cheese, macaroni and cheese, macaroni and cheese, macaroni and cheese. Get married. Fish and chips. What? Since when did you ever eat that? When she told me to. Ah, okay. So macaroni and cheese. If I open this box and poured it into my mouth in front of you today, which I will not do, but if I did, I would like you, personally for me, you won't be able to see this online, I'm sorry, but I'd like you to personally for me make the face that you would make if you poured this in your mouth. Would you go? Ready? One, two, three, go. Very nice. That was very good. Marcus is still looks exactly the same. So... So here's the truth we know about macaroni and cheese. What do you have to do first when you get macaroni and cheese? No, before that. Come on. You got to open the box. Okay, thanks for that. All right. And then what do you do? Boil water. Some of you said, well, you boil the water first, Eric, and then you open the box because why would you waste those five seconds that you could have that burner an extra five seconds of time? Okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. All right. So you open the box and then what do you do? You pour it in there, right? And you take that little packet out. Cause, uh, or how many of you have accidentally dumped the packet into the water? Like al done. <laughs> and so if you like your pasta slightly crunchy, that's al dente. If you like it to like fall apart when you go to eat it, that's al dente. And I like it al done. Al dente? Al dente. That's just a made up word for those of you who didn't know that. For those of you who are wondering about my pronunciation, it's terrible. All right, so... You cook it, it cooks nine minutes or four minutes if it's up to my wife. No, no she cooks it at least six. And, uh, and, then, and then you do what with it next? Strain it. Very good, very good. I, I'm so glad you guys know how to do all this. And then what do you do with it? You put some butter in the bottom of your bowl, right? And the more fattening, the better, right? Then you pour the noodles back in there. You put that cheese packet on top. And if you're a man, that's, you're done. But if you're a woman, you actually stir it. How many of you have ever not stirred it enough and you ended up with a mouthful of dry cheese? That's such a joy to have that experience. That means you're a little too hungry or a little too fat. One of the two, you decide. You decide. Once again, err on the side of putting shirts on, gentlemen. On the side of putting shirts on. Just when you go to the beach this week, just please err on the side of shirt on. Shirt on. Unless you're 23. If you're over 23, you probably need to get a boat. So um, then you mix it all up, and then what do you do? You eat it, and it's delicious. Now, if you tried to eat it right out of the box, it would be horrible. It would be horrible. I hope you haven't tried it. I hope you haven't just opened up that packet, and it, it's terrible. Because this needs to cook a little longer. Now, here's the deal. I want you to learn to read God's Word. I want you to spend time in Scripture... But if you spend time in Scripture without waiting to hear God, without allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart, you're doing the exact same thing the Pharisees did and the religious of leaders of Jesus' time did. You know the Word in your head, but you've not allowed God to apply it in your heart. And you wonder why the Bible is dead to you. Why you're bored in church. Why you don't desire to read scripture anymore. And for some of you, literally, it's just moments of taking time to listen to God. If you take time to listen to your God in your life, I promise you it is life changing. It's the difference between dry macaroni and cheese out of the box or actually cooking it. And so I just want to encourage you, if you don't catch anything from today's message, it would be to, to listen 
to what God is saying to you, to, to allow God to speak to your heart, to allow Him to bring conviction, to allow Him to bring change, to allow Him to inspire you to do or say or act in a certain way or to reach out to somebody or to do an act of service that you wouldn't otherwise do to allow God to speak to your heart in such a way that it changes you. We got to quit letting life distract us. You ever, any of you easily distracted? Anybody easily, dis, wait, wait, <clears throat> let me repeat that. Any of you easily distracted? Okay, let's try that again. There we go. Okay. Right. I did a, years ago, I did a retreat up in uh, Georgia, and the retreat was outdoor because they said it was going to be nice and cool, a bunch of liars that fed me that lie, and uh, so we had this big uh, pavilion, there were I think about 150, 200 youth, and I was the main speaker, they did the music, and they, did, they had a hoedown one night, and uh, uh, that was exciting, and uh, uh, they had games and everything, and I'll never forget, they had this great time of worship, and the kids were focused in, and I got up to speak, and I mean, the kids, I mean, it was like you could hear a pin drop. I was like, wow, this is going to be great, and literally, as I went to share, I like opened my mouth. All of a sudden, from the back of the room, I heard what sounded like a child screaming, and I'm going to cover my mic for just a second, and I'm sorry for those who are watching online, but I want to express what it was like. This is literally what it sounded like. Yeah, it was a pain without a microphone, I know. Trust me, you should have been there. So I'm up here, and all of a sudden a child, what I think is a child, is screaming from the woods. And of course, a few of the adults headed that way. And come to find out, somewhere on that overhang, hiding, was an evil frog. <laughs> and that frog decided that it did not like me talking. And it's really funny because Kyle was little at this time and on the way to camp, Kyle said, hey, dad, can I record your message? And if anybody wants to buy one, I'll sell them to him. And I said, sure, that's fine with me. I don't care. And so I think he sold tapes for a dollar each or something. What was funny is we have a record, had a recording. I don't know if, where it is now, but we had a recording and literally you hear me trying to talk and just some child screaming. Aah! They finally found the frog and relocated it, but it was too late. No one. No one heard a thing I said at this retreat because of the screaming frog. One of our members went home last night was watching a video on YouTube and found this, this screaming frog. And they said, you're right. And like, I was like, what, are you saying I was lying when I told the story? Is that? I think the main thing that keeps us from hearing God, and it's the reason for Matthew 6 where Jesus says, when you pray, go to a room and close the door. I think there's two reasons Jesus said that. Number one is you're not showing off. But the other thing is we live in a world full of busyness and always something going on. So let's look at these three keys to hearing God's voice. Number one, be still as you listen for his voice. And we're going to pick up the story in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3. And in this series on 1 Samuel, what I want to do for you is demonstrate to you, so many people today have said, well, I don't even need to read the Old Testament, and we don't need, listen, there's so many practical truths from the Old Testament that we as believers can see the Old Testament in light of the New Testament and, and discern what God is saying to us. And so we're going to look at this Old Testament story and get some practical truths. We're going to do that every week uh, this summer uh, as we look at 1 Samuel. Here it goes. Then the Lord called Samuel. And remember last week, uh, uh, Samuel was, was brought by his mother to the temple to serve in the temple. If you don't remember that, Google it. All right. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli. Now remember, Eli's the older priest who runs uh, 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 this, uh, what they're calling the temple at this time. It wasn't really a temple like Solomon, but, but uh, uh, Eli runs it. So he runs to him. And he says, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Doesn't that sound like our parents in the middle of the night? Just go, go lay down, right? And, and so again, the Lord called Samuel and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now, most scholars at this point point out that Eli, it didn't even, this is, this is how much Eli didn't listen to God. It didn't even cross his mind that this might be God calling. 
It, this isn't even close. By the way, one good thing you can see here too is God doesn't give up calling out to you. God, God doesn't just like call out to you real, and by the way, still small voice, and we're not going to talk about that too much today, but, but this whole idea, he doesn't just stop. Anyway, so it continues. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord hadn't been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And I love this. If he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went away and lay down in his place. So I got to thinking, what is one of the main things that keeps us from getting still? What's the main thing that keeps us from being quiet and hearing God? And I know we could say it's the noise of society. I know we could say it's just the busyness of our life or our world. But the truth is, I think for so many of us, it's not outward distractions, it's inward distractions. You, right now, while I'm talking, are having a conversation with yourself. I hope it's going well. <laughs> Mine would involve bacon. So right now, you're having a conversation with yourself. It might be man, what are we doing this weekend? It could be, what am I having for lunch? It could be, oh, I didn't like what that person said to me earlier this week. It could be like I do sometimes when I lay down, your brain plays the greatest hits. And what I mean by that is the greatest failures you've ever had and how you could have done things better. You ever relive a past regret over and over? By the way, that tends to happen at night. Isn't that funny how that works? Your brain all of a sudden says, instead of sleep, I'd like to face regret. Go. For some of us, it's worry. Worry is the opposite of listening. When you're worried, by the way, it's hard to listen to somebody. That's why sometimes when you're driving, you ready? The older you get, the more when something gets serious, you turn down the radio. You've probably done it without even thinking about it. You turn down the radio. Now, if you never turn down the radio when you get in a difficult time driving, I won't ride with you. Because <laughs> there should be times that you want to concentrate just a little more. But the truth is, we allow worry to distract us. And so Eli says, go lie down. Can I tell you what we need to do sometimes? We need to take our burdens to God. Those worries, those fears, those frustrations, even those regrets and say, God... I lay this down at your feet. God, I give this to you. Because it's very hard to listen to God when you're listening to worry and fear and regret and frustration and aggravation, which we all have all the time. All the time. All the time. Some of you are aggravated right now. Some of you are sitting next to the person who's aggravating you, right? And, and so the truth is, we have to lay those things down and say, God, I want to listen to you instead of all these other things. Why? Because there's always a distracting frog. Always. Always. I don't care how great your life is. There's always. Ah! Always. And if it's not an outward, it's an inward. If it's not something from outside. Uh, and so you have to say, I'm going to lay down. He had to make a choice to lay back down. And be ready to hear what God was going to say. And I want to encourage you, when you spend time in your Bible, whether you use a daily bread like we have out in paper, or you use it in your phone, but when you read a few verses every day, I want to encourage you, don't just read it. It's not just a one-way conversation. Ask God, God, would you speak to me through your word? When God speaks to you, when God shows you something, reveals something to your heart, I've never had God speak out loud to me. I've had people tell me that God has spoken out loud to them. I always feel like the first thing I might hear God say is build an ark. So it's okay with it, that not having that happen. But the truth is God will give you impressions. God will often reveal things to you. Many times he'll convict you of sin. Show you an area where you're worrying or show you an area where you're pursuing whatever you want and demonstrate to you that you've got to deal with that if you want to really listen to him. So let me read this verse, John 10, 27. I read it already. It says this, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and, I fo and they follow me. Charles Stanley, 
Although he studied, got his master's doctorate degree, thousands upon thousands of people influenced millions of listeners to his radio programs. He passed away recently, but he said years ago, the biggest impact of his messages always came from something he heard from the Lord. Not just something that he studied, not just something that he learned, but something that he felt like God put on his heart. When you allow those opportunities to get still and let God speak to you, he changes you. So let me ask you this question. Have you made time to be still? And Charles Stanley has said before, if you don't, then God has a way of putting us on our back sometimes, so then you're forced to. Even those trials, those tribulations, those struggles, you can make them where they fill your mind with fear, but they can also be the very thing that drives you to understand that you need God's voice and God's presence. Number two, be prepared to obey God's voice. I loved when I taught school. I loved to do different things that I knew the kids liked. So one of the things I liked to do was ceiling notes. You got junior hires. You get part of the way through the year, they're tired of listening to you. So what I would do is I'd say, we're going to do ceiling notes today. And all the kids would go, yeah. And what that meant is I was going to take the notes and put them on the ceiling. And the kids could get out of their desk, lay on the floor, and take notes. But here were the rules. If anyone, one student was not taking notes, everybody got back into their chairs and took notes. Oh, the peer pressure was awesome. (laughs) Because all I had to say was, well, it looks like Billy doesn't want us taking ceiling notes today. And you could feel the other kids go, we're all going to kill Billy. (laughs) And suddenly Billy was the best note taker ever in the history of school. If you are already planning on not obeying God, if you've got disobedience in your life, if God is speaking to you about an area of your life and you're going, na, 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 don't be surprised that you can't hear God in another area of your life. He's waiting for you to say yes to the thing he already showed you and demonstrated to you. Listen to what happens next, 1 Samuel 3, 10, 11. The Lord came and stood there. I love that. God is waiting for him. We sometimes feel like we're an inconvenience to God. I've had people say to me, I don't want to bother God with my request. Just the fact that you use the word bother shows that you think it's about you and not about him. Do you have a favorite person in the world? Somebody that you just enjoy when they talk, you're just like, ah. This is how deep God's love is. You may look at the person next to you and go, I know God doesn't enjoy them. That this is how deep God's love is. He does. He he loves you and I more than we could ever love ourselves, which is amazing because I know some people who really love themselves. But his love is real and it's deep. And it's beyond anything we can imagine. And so he stands there and he calls, as is other times, Samuel, Samuel. And I love how God repeats himself. He doesn't mind saying it again because most of us are like, what? Then Samuel said, speak, your servant is listening. Why does he use the word servant? Because servant means I'm ready to do what you want. God, I'm ready to do what you want. If you really want to hear God, one of the things I would say to you is, are you ready to do what he wants? If the answer is no, then maybe you don't really want to hear him. Maybe you really don't want him to convict you of sin. Maybe you really don't want to encourage you to do something that goes out of your way. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. Then it goes on, and we're not going to read this part today, but it basically is a prophecy for somebody else. Now, I will tell you that most of the time, When people make a mistake, it's when they say, God told me to tell you this. I've seen more mistakes with that in my life as a pastor than any other time. It's usually either a criticism or they're really self-promoting and blaming God. God told me to tell you, pastor, that I should be preaching here next Sunday. Really? And I learned from Harold Brantley years ago. That's when you say, well, if he tells me, I'll let you know. Be careful listening to what others say that God said to them for you. But I would encourage you to make sure you're listening. Because the truth is, when we spend time in prayer, God often, often points out attitudes that we have that are wrong. 
thoughts that we have that we need to turn over to him, worries that we're carrying and we think we can control. By the way, worry is just making yourself God, right? Because you're going to handle it. <laughs> Trust me, he handles it a lot better. God, I, God, I want to lay that at your feet, but you've got to get still. You've got to get still. New things are hard. When something new comes in your life, something difficult comes in your life, there's always a new challenge. There's always a new struggle. There's always a doctor who says, oh, make sure you come back in. I just got your test results. What are they? I can't tell you on the phone. Oh, no. Right? By the way, I always say, when doctors are in a hurry for you to come back in, that's not good news. If they're like, see me in a month, then you're like, man, no big deal. Okay. Peter Lord said this, and I love it. When is the last time you did something for the first time because you were being obedient to God? When's the last time you did something new to go out of your way to be a blessing to somebody? When's the last time you did something new because God was working on your heart and you've begun to change? You've begun to be different. In John 14, Jesus said this. Jesus answered or replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. It's this idea that God wants to have fellowship with you. What's heaven like? Heaven's like what it was like with Jesus on earth. You know what Jesus did a lot on earth? Dinners with people. I love that. When you look at the life of Christ, he was showing us the kingdom of heaven. He reminds us that the Lord's Supper, he said one time, I won't take it again till I'm in the kingdom, which means that we're going to have supper together. Jesus is serving Lord's Supper to us in heaven. I love that. He wants to be with you. He wants to fellowship with you. Is that your perception of God? Or do you make up your own perception of God? You have to read his words so you can understand God's voice. I mean, if you're sitting in prayer and all of a sudden you hear, go kill so-and-so, that's not God. It might be you because you're mad, right? But it's not God. It could be the pizza you had last night. Let me ask you the second question. Are you being obedient to God's word? Are you doing what God's called you to do? So be still as you listen. Be prepared to obey. Number three, seek God in his word. I heard this question the other day. If you were stranded on a desert island, what would be the one thing that you could, if you could take one thing with you, what would it be? The pastor said this to some kids, and they said, the Bible. The pastor looks at him and goes, nope. He said, how about a book on shipbuilding? Too often, when we're looking at life, we're trying to fix everything. When there's so much encouragement, so much wisdom in God's word, so much understanding on who God is. God has spoken to us. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. Whenever God speaks to you, it should always line up with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. People often blame God when the truth is they're just putting pressure on themselves. They're being manipulated. They're being controlled. A lot of times when we're in a hurry, it's not a godly hurry. I would say most of the time when you feel rushed, it's not God. It's you. Now there's a time to evacuate. I get it. When the fire breaks out, you don't just sit there and go, I'm waiting for God to speak to me. <laughs> But the truth is, most of the time when we're in a hurry, it's because we're not listening to God. We're just in a hurry. Samuel lay down, verse 15, till morning, and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, because it was negative towards Eli, by the way. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son, Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked, which shows once again that Eli wasn't taking time to listen to God. Eli didn't seem concerned that his student was hearing God and he wasn't. Don't hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide anything, anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. 
Then Eli said, he's the Lord, let him do what's good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. There's a verse that says that when God's word goes forth, it will always bear fruit. Understand that when you read God's word, when you allow God's word to sink into your heart, when you don't let the weeds of worry choke it out, that God's word will help you to grow and change. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Listen, if you want God to reveal himself to you, the first step is to spend time in his word. Get still and say, God, show me what you want to say in your word. Don't just read the Bible like a back box of macaroni and cheese where you just look at the ingredients. You read off the back of the box. Maybe you even pour a few in your mouth like a doofus. When you read God's word, say, God, would you speak to me? Let the word boil a little bit. Let him change his word because I cannot tell you the number of times that I've been reading God's word and it came alive like the Bible says. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 4. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges not only the thoughts, but the intentions of the heart. I wish that wasn't true because there's times that you will say something like, sure, I'll help you move. And what you really mean is, No, I don't want to help you move. But I feel guilty, so I'm going to help you move. Or, Pastor, that was a great sermon. And then you get in the car. That was the worst sermon I've ever heard. Pastor, you look nice today. What was he wearing? (laughs) The final question is this. Are you spending time in God's Word? See, hearing God's Word is life-changing. Let me tell you how much. I wouldn't be a pastor today if it wasn't. For God's word to me. And I think 99.9% of the time God speaks through the Bible. But I think there's times that God can give you an impression. That God can give you a direction. That God can give you a gentle push from his word. And sometimes just speak to your heart. I remember being in a pastor's conference with about 20,000 pastors when I was in my 20s. And I was just starting to pastor at a church. And I remember we were singing in this conference and there were all these guys in suits and ties and they all had this voice, which I can't do. That really hurts to actually try to. And they all talk like this. And I remember standing there and thinking, I can't do this. I'm not like these people. And I remember sitting down and just being discouraged and basically saying, God, I'm not like these people. I, I can't become like this. And as clear as a bell, I remember God saying, I didn't call you to be them. I called you to be you. Which was crazy to me, because I can be me all day long. I've I've been working on it. But I can't be you. And I can't be another pastor. And every once in a while, somebody comes to me and goes, well, my pastor, blah, blah, blah. And I go, that's great. You should go there to church. (laughs) I'd prefer to go to that church, too. I bet you he's great. God's only called you. Listen, he's only called you to be you. But in the middle of that, surrender to what he wants you to do. Surrender to letting him speak to you. Surrender to obeying him. If you're not obeying him, don't expect him to keep speaking to you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the first step in hearing him is to surrender your life to him. If you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service and you can come and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. I know that Jesus died and rose again. I know that I'm a sinner. I'm messed up. I'm broken. And I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to follow him the rest of my life. If you want to do that today, I'll be glad to pray with you and talk to you after the service. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, the truth is you've been listening to screaming frogs. A lot. And you haven't taken time to get still. I want to encourage you this week, even today, take time to get still. And sometimes stillness is just even when you're driving the car, just saying, God, thank you. God, thank you for all you've given. Thanksgiving is one way to get your heart still. Praise is a way to get your heart still. And then present your request to God. And the peace of God, peace of Christ, will transcend everything that's going on in your life. The frogs will get quiet. And you'll be able to hear God. Let's close in prayer. Would you join me? 
Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for your word. Lord, being still is difficult for me. It's difficult in our society. It's difficult for everyone. But Lord, may we get still this week to hear your voice. Speak to us, Lord. I pray. I pray that there's one here who hasn't heard you in a long time, that today would be the day they sense your presence. They sense your prompting. And continue to do in them what only you can do through your power and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.